already started. <laughs> All, right. All right. So we are we are still <clears throat> how shall I word this? We are still in the prodigal son study that has moved into <clears throat> in that study into <clears throat> the firstborn not being the elder son but becoming the prodigal son and we studied that for a good long while and then that moved us into our present study uh, well actually that moved us into exodus uh let's just say the first 14 chapters jumped to 34 14 and then jumped to 34. Um, and there we saw that two groups came out of Egypt, not one. Israel came out and the firstborn came out. And that the, that the lamb died for the firstborn, not for all of Israel. And that's made plain when you look at it and see that that took place. <clears throat> and so it's caused us to continue to search in the scriptures to understand God's relationship, his heart, his, his focus, his divine focus, his always focus, <laughs> is his firstborn son. And um, I mean, even there in Exodus chapter 4, when he said, you know, let my firstborn son go that he may serve me, that he may come out into the wilderness, that he may sacrifice and, uh, and be the sacrifice. Um, the real letting the son go isn't him coming out of Egypt. Uh, it's him coming out of the firstborn in the form of sacrifice, which y'all remember all the studies, so you know that that's, that's true. Um, <clears throat> and that, that pattern is the pattern we're going to see over and over and over again, that it is the altered son, it is the one at the altar, it is the uh, relationship at the altar that God has with his son. And, and that's why seated at his right hand is a slaughtered, crucified lamb. Pretty close relationship there. Seated at his right hand. Far above. Far above. And so... Um, so we've been studying Cain and Abel, and uh, we've gotten to, uh, well, we've gotten to the fourth chapter. You say that's the only place where Cain and Abel is. Okay, then we got, we're down to verse 7. We discussed verse 7 last class, but now we're going to put it in the context, context of verse 8. So let's start with 7, and don't think of 7 <clears throat> now in any particular way except for be open to what it says in verse 8. Okay. This is God speaking to Cain. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay, so um, the sin is not Adam, Ad Adamic sin. It is the sin or the failure of representing the firstborn. Just because you're there by birth right, or birth order, doesn't mean anything to God. Um, and so we would look at this only in light of, well, you know, Cain must have sinned or something, you know, because it says sin lieth at the door, but we have no record of, you know, I mean, we will later on discuss what people call the sin of Cain, but it's not usually what people focus in on. Um, but that they look, what they're looking at is something that 
basically either happened before this or, you know, killing Abel or something along that line. <clears throat> but the true failure and the true thing that God is addressing here is um, that you, you have fallen short or you have missed the mark. And you know that sin in the Greek means miss the mark. You've missed the mark of the Father's heart. All right. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to us. We just don't want to sin. You know, that's kind of the way it is in Christianity. I just don't want to sin. Miss the mark of the Father's heart. I don't even know what that is or care. You know, I'll figure that out when I get to heaven. But Jesus, you know, you remember what Jesus said? I do always those things that please the Father. Okay. So you can either say, wow, he's pretty, you know, he's pretty together. Or you can say, that's a firstborn right there. His focus is the heart of the Father. Okay, so, I mean, shouldn't this make us examine our own hearts? Shouldn't this, shouldn't this cause us to, to say, okay, if that's true, you know, you don't have to believe me, but if it is true, then each story that we go through all the way, we'll, I mean, we'll go all the way through Genesis, each story is going to be about this same theme, whether it's Cain and Abel or Ishmael and Isaac or Jacob and Esau or Joseph and his brothers. All the way to the end, every ounce of it is about who is going to be the firstborn. And what's funny is that the people that want to be the firstborn want it for what it can bring to them. Whereas that's the immediate disqualification <laughs> for the firstborn. Just that attitude immediately disqualifies you. And so, because Jesus as the firstborn of God, only begotten, he says, I do always those things that please the Father. And to take a, uh, a look at that in only terms of um, trying not to sin, it's just so, so far from the firstborn, from the heart of Jesus. Jesus isn't trying not to sin. You know, he's not worried about it. You say, yeah, he's the son of God. That was the line I used with the Lord once when the, when the father was talking to me. And he said, well, you know, you're, you know, what are you doing sinning? Jesus didn't sin or something. And I said, well, yeah, but he's, he's the son of God. He's your son. And he said, who do you think lives in you? Okay. Well, if Jesus lives in us the way he lived on the earth, then his focus isn't sin. He knows he's going to take care of sin. His focus is the Father. Okay, did he come up with that when the incarnation happened and he showed up in a manger? No, that's, he's always been that way. Because he's always the firstborn. Or... The, the, the little title that I've been introducing, and it'll grow and grow and grow. He's the beloved son. It'll grow. Because everyone that becomes a firstborn becomes a beloved son. Every one of them. And we'll see that. Okay, so... Um, then there's that, that statement, and, the, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him if you, if you do as well, if you shall be accepted. God didn't accept his offering, and God did not have respect unto Cain, but he looked with favor upon Abel's lamb as opposed to fruit of the curse. And looked with favor upon Abel, meaning there's been a change. There's been a change of who's, who is the firstborn. So immediately after he realizes 
I'm going to be ruled over by Abel. He's now the firstborn. All kind of pride kicks in. Somebody tell me what kind of, kind of pride could kick in to, in the elder's heart who thought he was going to be the firstborn. What is it? Enough to, <laughs> Enough to kill. Well, it would be what? Envy. Envy and yeah, and you know, uh, it's the and there, it's that same thing. Not fair. It's not fair. This is not fair. This is not fair. I'm telling you, I mean, I'm just going to tell you right now, if that ever goes off in your head, you are not only wrong, you are so out of whack with what's in God's heart for what he had planned for you that you hurt and disappoint him because that's what is in his heart for you. To not be going, well, this isn't fair. This is not looking for what's fair at all. You can't be a lamb and looking for what's fair. You cannot do that. You look for what is the Lord in that. You know, you look for the opportunity to be a lamb in that situation. And of course, you can't be, but the truth is, it's Christ in you. We bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but in the process of it, we become conformed to his image. That's what the wife of the lamb represents, one who, who has taken on his image, who is after his likeness, after his kind. And, um, and of course, how would, how would she become that? I mean, we say, well, Esther, and da, 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 da. okay, well, let's, let's look at even a bigger picture. It's called the real one. Yeah. <laughs> how would she become that? She would become that by, by seeing something in him that was worth giving up everything for. Okay, so now we're talking sort of like Ruth, maybe. Um, but, but that's still a shadow. This one, and it, the, the bride is made up of many that are one, but, but the wife of the lamb is seen as all of that becoming one with him so that he's the one. Um, and I, I addressed that in the book of Revelation when I was sharing and showed how the numbers were high when you began in the book of Revelation and they broke on down until it got down to one. And that one is him and her being one with him. So, so that, that heart is, whether male or female, that there is something about this one that I'm willing to give up all for. Okay, well, we always put that in terms of, well, I'll go to the ends of the earth. He doesn't want you to go to the ends of the earth. He wants you to go to the end of your earth. And that's only gonna happen at the cross. That's only gonna happen, and it's only, and it's only gonna happen at the cross. We say, well, Jesus took me there. Yes, he did. But we have to embrace that death. We do. We have to, you know, he, he did that 2,000 years ago, but it doesn't have any effect on us unless we embrace that death. But why would we embrace that death? You see how we're backing up and backing up until we get to the real deal. And the real deal is, is Jesus, your nature, your way is beautiful to me. Um, you can, a person could say, well, I am so bad that I want Jesus. Okay, well, that's kind of misses the mark too. You know, I'm just so bad. I just want you, Jesus, I'm so bad. Okay, there's a place for that. But that's not, hopefully that's not the end. The end is all I want to do is be one with you in the way that you think, in the way that you breathe, in the way that you talk, in the way that you move, in the way that you, you see things. Um, and I want that for all eternity. <laughs> okay. Well, some people are holding their breath being with the lamb. You know what I mean? I mean, they can't even make it down here for very long. But I'm telling you that there is a place where you see him. You see him. You see 
not what he can do, not how powerful he is, or not the things that, that he can fix, but you see him. And there is a place where in seeing him, you are captured, you're captivated. You know, I mean, it, you are, you're captivated. And it is, all right, this is it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very, it, it's, it's, it's clarity at its best. It's very clear. It's not, it's not foggy. It's not filled with muddy thing, muddy concepts. Just, at that point, it's very clear. I see you, and I want to be with you, not based on me or this or that. And that's why, that's why Jesus, um, many times the people that responded to him and really responded were the outcasts and the lame and the blind, the halt and the harlots and the, you know, that sort of thing was because they didn't really have anything to, to bring to the table. And that's what he wanted. Good. Come be one with me. Come be one with me. But the ones who had stuff, they got jealous. They got, they, they were, you know, they were like the elder son. And we'll see that here in a minute, Lord willing. So, verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up. Anybody heard that recently? He rose up, and he not only rose up, but he rose up against. Against what? His brother, Abel, his brother, and slew him. Okay? So, is it possible that Cain was thinking, if I slay Abel, in other words, if he's not around, I will be the firstborn again. Okay. Now, that's not an, that's not, that's not a, no, that's not an, uh, that's actually what much of the Bible is about. Is that, you know, but to think that way would mean that you literally have a wrong concept of what being the firstborn is. And I will tell you this, even with everything that I've said in the prodigal son and in Exodus and, and now in this story, I have yet to really show certain aspects of this that are, that are, um, that are just wonderful. It's just wonderful. Um, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about an aspect that, and, and if you'll notice, I mean, we, yes, we started with the product of the son. We went to Exodus because the Lord told me, and now we're just starting with two brothers and we're going through, and they all are two brothers and they're all elder and younger, and it's always who's gonna be the firstborn. There's always either anger or death and all this kind of stuff. But there is a place where we're gonna get in this where once it is revealed in truth and in spirit, you and I, we will rejoice with the Father over exactly what it is that constitutes in the Father's heart his firstborn son. Now, we talked about a lot of stuff, haven't we? We talked about the altar, right? We talked about all these things. But I don't believe that that's, I don't, I don't believe any of that hits home yet because now I'm on the order of the word of God. It'll pop up in one of the stories that's coming. But right now, he's just trying to get us to see the basics of that in this, in this first big story. All right. So, he, Cain rose up. He did it. And when he rose up, he did something against. You know, you usually don't do something against somebody unless you rise up. I know that's just too simple, so it doesn't mean anything. If we could, if we could see that, that if we could, if every time something rose up in us, and we could go, uh, 
I'm capable of doing stuff now because I've allowed Haman or I've allowed my flesh or I've allowed Cain, you know, I'm raising Cain, you ever heard that before, uh, to rise up, to rise up. Well, I, you know, all that stuff. Whether you kill somebody or not is not the issue. <laughs> you need to see that that right there at that moment is as far from the firstborn as you can be. Okay? You need to see that. It's important. You know, if you don't see that, then you'll just say, well, I got mad. I mean, I remember when the Lord was sharing with me about the cross when I was in Bible school. This, this brother came into class and he was, ah, you know, he's mad and all this kind of stuff. And I said, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, I guess I got up on the wrong side of the bed. I said, no, you got up on the wrong side of the cross. Okay, but that, while that might sound funny or something, the Lord was already working in me a reality that wasn't, I, I have a life down here, and sometimes I'm, I'm angry, and sometimes I'm, and it's all okay because it's the way I was before I got saved, and this is what I'm familiar with, but the Spirit of God was already slamming me with the cross and wouldn't allow me to do that, and I can even go into a major story where God slapped me down in that area and it broke me and it caused me to weep and I said this is it I, I gotta have you and it was a very simple thing on a certain front but it was it was just what I needed because I saw you see to me it wasn't well I, I want it to be Abel and not Cain no to me it I just want Jesus not me you know, I didn't have to know I was puffed up like a firstborn that's not truly a firstborn. I just could say it was easy for me because in my little dumb little simpleton brain, I thought I can tell what's not Jesus in me. I can tell when I have an attitude or when I'm doing this or when I'm rising up or when all this kind of, and. You know, while, while the truth is you can't fully tell, you can tell enough at a certain juncture to go, you know, whether it's, whether it's you, know, you know, slaying Agag or, you know, not refusing to be Cain. But all of those are just stories. They're just stories. And we think we know so much because we know the story until it becomes our story. It has to become our story. And then we'll find out who we are. Because <laughs> we always, you know, we're always the good one. You know. We're always the, uh, every man's way is right in his own eyes. Well. When you see him, it's not a matter of seeing what's wrong, although you see a lot of it. It's a matter of what is your heart saying now? I'm too bad, I need to go, or um, I'm better than this, or um, I'm looking at something that I'm so not. But I so would love. Love is a good word. I would love to have that even a little bit every once in a while. Now, the truth was, I'm not speaking for where I am now, but back then it was like the dream of, of that nature, that kind of selfless giving at work in me, just, if I could just have it, you know, like three times a week, I would, that'd be a victory, you know. Now I want it every second. And, you know, I have not yet attained, but I'm still pressing towards the mark. I haven't quit that, have I? I hadn't quit that. All right. 
so uh, let me read a little bit of this. The words spoken just before Cain slew Abel, as we just saw, were in verse 7. God's first, God first explains to Cain that if he did the right thing, which is having the right spirit in this, um, he would have been accepted. Accepted how? He would have been counted as the firstborn. Then the Lord proceeds to tell him that if he doesn't do well, then there must be some disqualifying reason. Okay, now that's, I think the Holy Spirit gave me that word. In. I mean, I really do because, because we say sin lieth at the door. So we start looking for the sin that's, you know, messed, you know, why didn't this happen for me? <laughs> right there. <laughs> Um, it's that something, there's a, a disqualifying reason, and that reason lies in how you approach everything. Anybody ever remember me saying something about approach is everything? Oh, Lord, you just don't know. If you, if you could just somehow... Write that on a clear piece of sheet, you know, and then put it over the Bible and just go, oh, 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 oh. You would see approach is constantly a factor. Well, we're, we're Protestants, <laughs> you know, or whatever we are. We're Baptists or we're this and that. You know, there is no... Method, sorry, we're Methodists. There is no method that gets you there. The approach is an approach in relationship to your heart. Now, I'm going to just, I'm going to go off. I've, I shared this a long time ago, but it still, still holds true, and that is, most people, they, they, they are a certain way. Some people are strong, some are weak, some are happy all the time, some are sort of quiet, some people are da-da-da-da. It doesn't matter. There's a variety of kinds of people, and most people that become a Christian go to the Word of God and pick out the things that describe them. Well, I'm... I'm very efficient. And look what, look what the scripture says here. And you're not. Well, you may be efficient in that, but you're deficient in his nature. Or, you know, I mean, e any subject, any, any thing, you know, and we, what we do is we anoint that thing in us. You know, we don't even have the Lord anoint it. We anoint that thing in this. And we say, God, look how much I'm like what you want. And how many years can we go like that? You know? And, and he's just going, look, that's just you. You have perverted the scriptures, and instead of conforming to my image, you have conform the word to your image, to what you're like. Well, I'm very kind. And Jesus likes kind people. Um, no. I, this is hard for some people. No, he doesn't like kind people. He wants his son and love. And what is, what is God? God is love. God is not kindness right? God is love. And love is kind. And love is, uh, and you go through chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you go through all of that. And the greatest of these is, you know, and so we, we've got all of these things in us that we got polished up and we think that this is, this is, uh, this is the um, the way, this is the money with, with which God um, gives and takes. Okay, so here, Lord, here. I'm, I'm this, oh, and I've also got this. Because I'm not just kind. I'm, I'm ready. 
I'm ready to do great things. Okay, and, and we, you know. So Jesus comes across the rich young ruler. He's got it all. He's rich. He's young. He's a ruler. <clears throat> and you give a person an inch and he thinks he's a ruler. <laughs> There's a real truth in here, you know. There's a real truth in here because we, you know, you, you, get, you give a little slack and oh, boy, you see all kind of stuff that wasn't kindness or readiness. It was ambition. Or, you know, there's too many, but you do realize there's too many subjects and too many people to describe everybody. But the point is, is that how many of us are going, I don't care about what I got or what I don't have. I want to decrease and I really want to do it. And not only I want to do it, I must, he must increase and I must decrease. And, and if it doesn't happen, you know, have you ever seen a, a, an addict that had to have drugs? Well, most of you haven't, but you know. I gotta have it. I gotta have some now. I must have it. Well, did you know the, the saints are addicted? <laughs> but there has to be that hunger first for him. I mean, there's no, there is no need to be addicted to the ministry unless we're addicted to Christ first. And that's the truth. That's the truth. There, there's, there's all this stuff that we can do. Oh, and, you know, every church in the world will say, oh, a warm body, here. We'll, you know, and once you give them something to do, then they say, okay, and they keep, they keep them in that church, and then their tithes come in, and this and that. And, you know, the, when the truth is, if they're not ready, you don't want them. <laughs> if, they're, if they can't hear, you know, Jesus said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Well, what about us? Well, maybe with time. I, you know, there's not a one of us that understood the message of Christ and him crucified just on our own. God brought us to that. And to see anything has been the grace of God. So we're not better than anybody else. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, immediately following this conversation, Cain draws Abel into a field and kills him. What would cause a person to go as far as to, to slay his own brother? Well, apparently, verse 7 would. You know, I'm not going to rule over my younger brother, but the right belongs to me. I am right. I deserve this. It's supposed to be mine. Everything belongs to me. Well, just having that attitude means God's going to take you down. I mean, it's just the truth. It is. He says, if you exalt yourself, I'm going to humble you. But if you humble yourself, I'll exalt you. So we go, oh, yeah, I believe that. And then as soon as there got, comes up a situation, we start exalting ourselves. Well, guess where you're headed? You know, and guess who it's going to bring you down? Not the devil. I mean, you don't want to be against God. <laughs> you can be against the devil, but don't be against God. And, and that, that spirit, that spirit that exalts itself, that, that spirit that says, and see, the problem is we don't really believe all this. We don't believe that if we humble ourselves, he'll exalt us. Because we can only humble ourselves for like seven minutes, I think. I think that's the, <laughs> at a time. You know, that's the, I think that's the limit, you know. <laughs> it's right in there somewhere. And we, we humble ourselves. But we usually humble ourselves to get somewhere. 
That's usually what's going on. We still got wrong motives working, and those motives are exalt myself. Okay? Well, you're not going to get to Jesus by exalting yourself. That's not how you get to Jesus. Remember the prodigal son story? Okay, the elder son, when, when the father had to go out to him, he's going, you know, I've done everything right, and I've done good, and I've done, done and you never gave me. I've given, but you've never given me back. When is my turn? Apparently never, buddy. The other son, prodigal son, comes back and says, Father, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Oh, you're moving right into candidacy for, for being a firstborn. You're, that's the first step. When you have been brought so low that he can exalt you. See, the prodigal didn't exalt himself, did he? And it was probably shocking to him. It was probably shocking. I came to just be nothing. I came to, to just be as one of the servants. These are the words he used, just to be as one of the servants. Why are you exalting me? I'm not, you know, it's like at any other time I would have loved this. <laughs> but I am not in a mood. I'm not in a place where I want that. I just would like to be back in the house. I'd like to eat what you eat, Father, but he's still thinking of bread, not sacrifice. But he's going to be exalted to that. He's going to be brought up into that by the Father. Well, <clears throat> so... Um, Cain hears that the right of the firstborn has moved to the younger son. And that's all that he can, you know, you get consumed with things. Did you know you can get just consumed? It just rolls over and over and over, you know. Uh, I've found the only thing that deals with that is to get into the word whether reading the Bible or listening to something else and keep at it and keep doing it until you get to a place where you can join in with it even though you're not fully there and you can say, that's not my mind, that's my mind and this is what I want and this is not what I want and even though it appears it is what I want because it's still at work, this is not me. Jesus, that's me. That's who I'm one with. Well, it does turn over. You do tip the scales. You, you know that. You do tip the scales. The problem is we spend our life kind of going like this. You know, we go, and then when we get down and out, and we're, oh, I just want the Lord. And so we tip the scales again back in the favor of the Lord. But then we slowly let other things get in. I mean, isn't there a place? Isn't there a place to just go, Jesus, I'm tired of this up and down. I just want you. Clearly, I can't do that myself. Okay, that's getting close to a prodigal son attitude. That doesn't mean you're the firstborn yet. <laughs> you, but you understand that. I mean, that's a, that's a necessary step. It's got to happen. I mean... In other words, the, the sword of the spirit, we've been given the sword of the spirit. We, we have the whole armor of God, you know. He doesn't put it on us so we can sit down in the corner and go, boo -hoo. <laughs> Why is everything going not my way? I want my way. Well, If he gave you your way, it would be so bad. You think you'd be happy. 
So trust me, even when you think you want your way, don't ask for it and, and kind of rebuke it a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's just a good idea. You don't want to go there, you know, because remember the children of Israel, we want flesh, we want, we want flesh. So God caused the south wind to blow and all these quail come in and they eat quail till it's coming out their nose. What did it say? Something like he filled their belly with quail or flesh, but sent leanness in their soul. God, come on, come on. I know every one of us cringe when we hear that. Let's stop cringing and go, I don't want that. You know? And we say, well, I can't say that because I have leanness in my soul. <laughs> There's really no hope for me. You know, can I just say this? Anyone who says there's no hope for you, this is going to sound like JW, is the stupidest person in the world. <laughs> Be because if you have Christ in you, there's hope. There's always hope. The problem is just having him in there is not enough. You have to hope in him taking over. You know, you know I got him in there, so I got hope. I hope I do. And that's what we would say. Well, I mean, that, that's what we would say because we're not moving with it. We're just, we're just, you know, well, thank God. Randy said, if I got Christ in me, I got hope. So praise God, I got hope. But it only takes a few seconds to go, God, I hope I do. But Randy said it, you know, my God, that's got to be it because, you know, he said it, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but you're laughing because you know you've done that before. <laughs> and that's the deal. That's what the deal is. That's why it's striking a chord. You know, people think, people hear laughing when I'm preaching, when they're listening to stuff, and they think, well, Randy must be really funny. Well, I ain't funny. It's hitting a chord. All right. So... I want to. I want to read something to you. Can I do that? I'll read it and then I'll tell you where to turn for the part two of it. Okay. This is. I'll tell you where it's at, but don't turn there yet. Okay. It's in Matthew 21. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. But what think ye? He's talking to these people, so he's going. Well, what do you think? What think ye? A certain man had two sons. This isn't the prodigal son story. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. But it's going to take both parts before we fully see it. And he came to the first. <clears throat> said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered, said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Which of them did the will of his father? Okay, they say unto him the first. All right. So, so here, in a sense, we have a reversal. We have the, the, the son with the firstborn according to birth order, but he's got something toward the father. I mean, even if he says no and I ain't going to do it, and then he goes, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be with him. You know, he asked me. I'm going to be with my father. The other one goes, oh, yes, sir. I will do it. And then doesn't do it. So the question is, which of these is the firstborn? Well, they answered it, <laughs> and I already read it. The first. Um, 
They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. All right. If that doesn't mess with your religion, I don't know what will. The Pharisees are going, All we've done is serve the Lord, elder son. All we... We... What are you saying? Harlots? You know? Republicans? <laughs> Sinners? <clears throat> You're wrong. Okay, no. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Because you don't understand. You don't understand. Because you don't understand. Because you have worked hard to earn it. And it is unfair when you don't get it. And Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees here. And he said, these, these are going to go in before you do. They're the, they're the prodigal son. They're the ones that messed up and messed up and did this and did that and got a laundry list of what's wrong and yet come back to the Father in a different spirit and find the heart of the Father that draws out the Son in you. Notice I didn't say you come to a revelation and da 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 da. I mean it is, it becomes where the heart of the Father draws the Son out of you. What a, that's a prayer request. But how did he approach? What was his approach? It's always approach. An approach is always a heart condition. And it's always one not of our making or our understanding. It is when we lose and we, we, we everything just falls down around us and we are brought to a place where we can choose. Either I ain't going back there to the father's house because I'll look like an idiot because I got he gave me all this stuff and I got nothing. Or, man, I, what am I doing in this hog pen? You know, even if I was a servant, I would at least be with the father. And that. You, so that that thought draws you there, and there's a brokenness in it, and that brokenness cannot be attained by trying to be there. I know that's tough. That's why harlots and sinners never then get in before, <laughs> because it cannot be attained. You have to go through certain things. And again, I'll say it. And you have to stick with the plan. You have to stick with it. You can't jump up and go, well, it's okay now. It's all, it's all going to be okay. I feel better. I've been feeling better the last couple of times. Maybe the, this is probably, and don't do it until you feel the Lord, well, until you know it's the Lord. Because you can check yourself. You can go, well, it ain't the Lord and me yet, but I, you know, I am feeling better. Don't go by your feelings. Amen. Choose, blessed are the day that mourn. Amen. Choose. Okay, so, um, So we'll read the, the next part of that here in a second. In all these cases and more, since the elder does not gain the birthright, then the elder becomes angry toward the younger. So the rest of that is, if you, if you haven't turned there, it's Matthew 21. And we're going to read the, I think it's the very next verse. Let me look here. If it's not, it, uh, I skipped part of a verse, but that's all. It's just right down after it. This is Matthew 21, verse 33 through 41. Okay. 
Now, before we read it, and please don't read it ahead yet, please, because you're going to hear it again. You hear me? You're going to hear it again. And you're either going to think, Randy has this weird way of being able to make the scriptures say what he wants them to, or they're actually saying all this about the firstborn. Okay, so you ready? Verse 33, Jesus speaking. Here another parable. <laughs> there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went, went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he, um, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. Verse 35, and the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Okay, now verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Okay, now I'm going to read. This is also in uh, Luke and Mark. So I'm just going to pull out that one verse that matches the one we just read. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. And then the other gospel. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. So I wrote, hear how an elder son speaks. Um, well, let's look at it. Verse 38, but when, but when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. Is this not the exact same thing we've been discussing over and over and over? Okay. And do you hear the elder son? Anybody hear it? This is the heir. Uh, let's seize his inheritance. How are we going to do that? We're going to kill off the one that, you know. And, you know, Jesus said if you... You hate your brother without a cause. I hope I deal with that later on in here because because we're all justified because we got a cause. Um, the, let's see. The parable deals with those who are not firstborn, who are jealous over the son. The father expects that they will reverence the place of the son who is the firstborn. Remember, in one of the gospels, he calls the son his beloved. They kill off the firstborn thinking they are now the firstborn. What deception. What deception. <clears throat> um, so they assume that murder, envy, discontent will make them the firstborn son. Wow. Little did, little did they know that by killing him, the stone that was rejected has become the head of the corner. Okay, so, um, but in verse 42, Jesus is saying that the living firstborn did not gain the inheritance uh, and the blessings, but the dead son did become the firstborn. And that's, I think, verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures? This is immediately following this. You do understand that. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the firstborn, the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, not just wicked firstborn sons that are killing everybody. <laughs> um, it's the plan. That's how he determines his firstborn son. That's how he finds him. They're given crucify
It's marvelous in our eyes. Well, it's not marvelous in our eyes. Come on. We, when we see it, we don't see it in the context here. We don't see the pattern. We maybe understand the pattern, especially when we're emphasizing it. But we get into life, and then all we see is, well, this person's being mean to me, and this person should have done that, and I should have been this, and all this. And we get all bent out of shape over stuff of the earth because we're trying to be something down here instead of trying to be something to the Father by the Son. And so it's just, we're just wrestling and fighting and all this stuff. And every time you come across this story, it always ends with death, and it's always going to be the firstborn. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing? Gosh. I think we need to stop. Well, I don't think we need to stop, actually. I think we need to keep going until, until we get it. But we do have time constraints. Oh, praise God. We, we still have good stuff coming. <laughs> I mean, it's just so good. It just keeps on going. It just keeps rolling. It's like you're in a, a hippie van going from the East Coast to the West Coast. It can't get any better than that. Jim, Jim Allen said it. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for what you're opening to us. Things of your heart, things of eternity, things of the way that we can relate to you by the Son that is an eternal relationship instead of relating by our earth lives, our hurts, our needs, our wants, our, our tears for what we don't have. <clears throat> None of that, uh, that, that's fine. And you take care of all those needs in a wonderful selfless way. But at what juncture are we going to stop being the object and give you your son? You're calling your firstborn son out of us. And you're saying stop being Israel that just got deliverance. And start releasing my firstborn to me in death. Father, thank you. I, I believe that you're sharing this because you told us through Jesus not to cast our pearls before swine. I believe that you, of anyone, would have discernment enough that you're not doing that. You're trusting us with your heart, not just your words, with your heart. And that we will be moved towards you. We will be moved by it. We will be moved from making ourselves the center of the universe and making us the, the center of our, our world, our solar system. But we know the sun is the center of it. We know that the sun brings light to this earth and life. And we know that when we focus on you, <laughs> yeah, like Paul, we become blind to the earth. But we come alive to you, like Paul did on the road to Damascus. So we are reaching out we are reaching out. We are not passive. And we're not hearers only. We are letting the storm rock our boat because we know that you're going to show up shortly. So have your way. Rock our boat. 
we are reaching out to you. We do want you. And we want to relate to you by your firstborn son and not as Israel. Just seeking deliverance all the time, seeking help, seeking miracles, seeking everything that would make life more comfortable down here. So we ask you to do it, not in our name or because we deserve it, like the prodigal. We are no longer worthy to be called a son. We need to take that out of our vocabulary and make the son, your son, your firstborn son, the object that will reach that will reach you and will reach your heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.